So one of the most important things that you will see as a physician are, is small bowel obstruction. Now, normally there should not really be any air within the small intestine. Here is an abdominal film that has lots of dilated loop of small bowel stacked upon itself. We call this a staircase pattern. And you can see the nasogastric tube, which is inserted. I can't tell if it's in the stomach um, or small bowel or a little bit of both. Here we have another reason for a small bowel obstruction, and this is called an internal hernia. This is small intestine here, and we have a hole in the mesentery through which another piece of small bowel has crept its way and can get tangled in there and cause a bowel obstruction. This looks to me more like the patient has too much poop inside their colon and not really a small bowel obstruction. This could be an obstruction secondary to severe constipation. Here's another example of something called a Meckel's diverticulum, which is located here on the uh, anti-mesenteric side of the uh, small intestine. Of course, we have to talk about appendicitis. Appendicitis is one of the most common reasons that people have abdominal surgery. And you might be interested to see that the appendix, most of the time, is actually located in a subsecal or even a retrocecal position. That means that the appendix is folded under the cecum and the surgeon, in order to find the appendix, has to mobilize the cecum along the white line of tolt, which we've learned about before, move the cecum medially and expose that retrocecal appendix. Another etiology and cause for uh, abdominal discomfort is a Meckel's diverticulum. Now, you have learned about this in your embryology lectures. This is a true diverticulum made up of all the layers of the bowel, which is a remnant of the vitalin duct, and it occurs on the anti-mesenteric side of the small intestine. Meckel's diverticula are famous for following the rule of twos. It usually occurs in kids who are younger than two years old. It's usually about two feet from the ileocecal valve. It's about two inches in length, and it has two types of mucosa with it, gastric mucosa and pancreatic mucosa found within two inches of either side of the Meckel's. So the proper way to remove a Meckel's diverticulum if it causes a problem with bleeding or perforation or bowel obstruction is you have to resect two inches on either side of it to remove the potential for the other two pieces of gastric and pancreatic mucosa that are ectopically located there. Of course, the vitalin duct can still be attached to the very tip of the Meckel's diverticulum, and a piece of small intestine can wrap around that, and it can cause a bowel obstruction. So this is just an example of some of the mesentery uh, and how the uh, persistent um, vitalin duct can cause a Meckel's diverticulum. So in most cases, the vitalin duct, which is this fibrous cord, actually uh, absorbs and you end up with just the complete Meckels here. Sometimes you can get a fistula and they can have uh, small bowel contents come out their belly button. You can get a vitalin cyst or you can get an umbilical sinus where sometimes not only succus entericus comes out, that small bowel fluid, but you can also get some uh, colonic regurge and actually get feces that comes out of this. This is a scan that is designed to be used in the nuclear medicine department. And what you see here is a highlight of the Meckel's diverticulum. The patient is actually given an injection of a radioactive chemical, which goes right to the Meckel's. Um, what you're seeing here is probably gastric mucosa, um, but this is the Meckel's. These are not common uh, to be done because Meckel's Complications are actually not that common. Here is an example of a Meckel's diverticulum that has perforated and has probably caused a bowel obstruction. And of course, here's, a, here's an example of all the different things that can occur with a Meckel's diverticulum. You can have a malignancy within the Meckel's. You can have the bowel twist around it. You can have a hernia within the Meckel's. This is called a Latre's hernia, L I T T. RE apostrophe S, Latre's hernia. You can have torsion or strangulation, and it can also intussuscept, fold in on itself. So a Meckel's can result in lots of complications uh, of these vitalin duct remnants. 
Of course, I told you earlier that diverticuli can occur throughout the entire uh, GI tract. You can have esophageal diverticuli, the Zenker's diverticulum proximally. You can have a mid-esophageal diverticulum, uh, epiphrenic diverticulum. And these are examples of small bowel diverticuli. These are called jejunal diverticuli. These can become infected and you get jejunal diverticulitis. They can also perforate. This is another example of jejunal diverticuli. I've taken care of several of these in my career. This is an example of jejunal diverticuli that has perforated, and this patient will have to have this piece of intestine resected. When we're looking at inside the small intestine, there can be polyps inside the small bowel. There can be malignant growths, multiple polyps causing an obstruction, or we can have just a big lipoma, just like that small bowel uh, camera showed us a, a couple of slides earlier. And of course, you can have cancer in the small bowel. All of these can cause small bowel obstructions. We mentioned intussusception, but sometimes in infants, this can just occur for no reason other than bad luck. In adults, a tumor or a meckles or a polyp can serve as the lead point for the intussusception. But sometimes in children, this just occurs. What you get on the CAT scan is something called a target sign. And this is the small bowel, which is intussuscepted into the larger small bowel around it. So some of the most common small bowel pathologies that we see are small bowel obstructions, secondary to adhesions, internal hernias, where you have a defect within the mesentery and another loop of bowel can make its way through it. Foreign bodies, if a child swallows two magnets, not just one, but two, then the magnets can stick together and cause two pieces of intestine to stick together and erode between where the two pieces of magnet are actually stuck. Appendicitis, the cause in children and infants can be lymphoid hyperplasia. In adults, as I mentioned earlier, it's usually a piece of poop, a fecal lip. And then, of course, in Meckel's diverticulum, the rule of twos. Here's a really good image of a Meckel's diverticulum with, I think this is probably a remnant of the vitalin duct here. And of course, jejunal diverticula, which we saw earlier, they can also perforate and cause acute abdominal pain. In addition, you can have lipomas of small bowel, cancer, or polyps, any of which can cause uh, intussusception. So now let's look at some of the anatomy that we would see from a laparoscope. Here we're looking at the colon. This is normal colon. This is tinea coli here. And these are haustra, the folds of colon that help to propel and to push the uh, stool and fecal contents forward. So if we follow the tinea down here, we can see this muscular band. So here, of course, is colon. Here's tinea. Here's more tinea that I just pointed out. Here's another view laparoscopically. This is transverse colon with its tinea on top. Here is the gastrocolic ligament. This is a stomach here, and the gastrocolic ligament is attached to the transverse colon. And you know that if we divide this right here and raise it up, we can get into the lesser sac. Here is nothing except me pushing a trocar through the abdominal wall. So this is parietal peritoneum up here, and I'm pushing my instrument, and it's getting ready to perforate through the anterior abdominal wall. This, of course, is small intestine that we see back there. Another look, just a different look of, of looking at our uh, transverse colon and a very redundant transverse colon at that along with descending colon. So this transverse colon actually goes down here and comes up and over. So we're looking at a very redundant transverse colon with the anatomy that has been labeled on top of it. Here is uh, peritoneum. This is parietal peritoneum. This is uh, omentum here. Of course, descending colon. And you can see the, the tinea and the individual haustra that make up the muscular compartments of the colon. Here's another view of a laparoscopic uh, colon. We can see haustra much better here. This is haustra. This is haustra. Here's tinea, which is one of the muscular bands that runs along the colon. Again, we're looking at, and we'll label all this for you. This is ascending colon. Again, this is tinea here, tinea coli, the muscular longitudinal muscular band. This is the hepatic flexure of the colon. This is the liver, of course. Here's gallbladder. 
and then we see transverse choline here. This, of course, is omentum, and down here at the bottom, we have a little bit of small bowel peeking its way through. This, of course, is what it looks like in a cadaver, and you can see that there's quite a bit of difference. Here's cecum. Again, this is tenia, not seen as well. Transverse colon, hepatic flexure. Can't barely see it, but this is liver, and of course, this is small bowel. So when we do a colonoscopy, how is it that we actually know what we're looking at and where we are? You learn this by simply learning and doing. There is a colonoscope um, simulator where you can learn to do colonoscopies this way. This is not the way I learned to do them, but it will actually show you where you're at in the colon. Hopefully this will take us out to a link that's still live. Scope Guide is a real-time 3D view of the shape and position of the scope inside the patient, designed to improve patient comfort and procedural efficiency. Endoscopy suites are busy with many demands. Quality care and comfort are expectations for the patient and the physician. But the business of endoscopy demands efficiency as well Scope Guide, an integral part of EVIS Xera 3, is an imaging tool that provides a three dimensional visualization of the shape and position of the colonoscope inside the colon. Colonoscopy is challenging and at times unpredictable, demanding the most skilled physicians and the most advanced equipment. Scope Guide provides physicians with the ability to identify and mitigate loops, recognize difficult anatomy, and document procedures in greater detail. It can help with easier and more confident scope insertion, loop identification, determine optimal location to apply abdominal pressure, gauge timing anesthesia, all leading to efficiency. Electromagnetic coils incorporated along the length of the dedicated scope's insertion tube generate a pulsed low-intensity magnetic field that is picked up by the sensors of the scope guide receiver dish. The magnetic pulses are used to calculate the precise position and orientation of the insertion tube to generate a three-dimensional rendering that is refreshed several times per second. Here, you can see the optimal room setup. Assistants use the hand coil to track the scope's insertion tube from outside the patient's body. Using the hand coil, the assistant applies hand pressure when and where it is likely to help, often for a few seconds only. Scope Guide allows the physician to visualize loops beginning to form in the endoscope. Visualization of the exact type of loop allows the physician to take specific actions to reduce and remove the loop as it's beginning to form. This is particularly helpful for educating fellows on loop reduction techniques, reducing patient discomfort and potentially reducing procedure time. Also, nurses have access to additional information to document exact locations of biopsies and samples, potentially increasing the accuracy of follow-up examinations. Scope Guide enables efficient and comfortable colonoscopies, providing important information to the entire endoscopy team. Physicians identify and mitigate loops. Assistants apply abdominal pressure to the correct location. Nurses document precise locations for biopsies and samples. Anesthesia gauges procedure timing and administers proper sedation. Physicians document procedures with endoscopic and scope guide images. Fellows train with visual anatomy cues to help them become proficient. So you have to admit the technology is actually pretty good. In the upcoming uh, teaching video, um, I actually encourage you to watch it so that you can learn and see how we can tell where we're at when we do a colonoscopy. I didn't learn using scope guide. I learned by doing colonoscopies on uh, veterans and we often did not use any sedation. So it taught us to be very, very subtle and very careful. So as we work our way through the colon, we can identify the anus, the ampulla or the opening of the rectum, the valves of Houston, 
we can identify the sigmoid and we can see the splenic flexure because we can see the, a little blush blue of the spleen showing through the wall of the colon. This is a good picture of transverse colon because we can recognize it by its triangular uh, shape. The hepatic flexure, we'll see the blue blush of the liver, the ascending colon, and we can see the crow's foot and the cecum, as well as the appendiceal orifice. And if we're careful enough, we can actually intubate retrograde the uh, ileal cecal valve and look into the small intestine. So um, this is a good uh, time to uh, click to watch this teaching colonoscopy. This is the appearance of the normal ileal mucosa as viewed through a standard video colonoscope under an aqueous medium. These delicate villi are 0.2 to 0.4 millimeters long and contribute significantly to the 500-fold increase in surface area of the small intestine. In fact, between the folding of the small bowel, these surface villi, and then the addition of the microvilli at the luminal side of each absorptive cell, the surface area of the small bowel is roughly equivalent to that of a high school basketball court. The pluripotential stem cells at the crypt base differentiate into the four epithelial cell types, absorptive, enteroendocrine, goblet, and penef cells, which then mature and move up the villus length over a four to seven day period before exfoliating into the bowel lumen. A wide variety of inflammatory conditions can destroy or flatten this villus architecture. Those most commonly seen in this area include viral and bacterial infections and inflammatory bowel disease most characteristically Crohn's disease.